World War II, Nazis are killing civilians. It was called the sardine method. Victims laid in layers, like sardines in a jar. An effective way to exterminate many people in a short time. But this film will not be about the Nazis. Hands tied behind the back. An expertly aimed shot in the neck. And the fall into a huge mass grave. These people were not killed by the Nazis. They were killed by one of the Allies, the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was killing people in this way for many years, both before and after it joined the Allies. These victims had no memorials. They were buried in anonymous mass graves. The murderer's power that killed them and the powers that collaborated with the murderer were never actually prepared to talk about them. The memory of millions of innocent victims was erased from history. Youth throughout the world likes to make jokes using popular symbols of the past. While the Nazi swastika is considered to be a bad joke, Soviet symbols are not. <laughs> Communism, after all, was not Nazism. It was about equality and harmony. There was nothing wrong with the idea itself. Well, actually, there was. There was something which made it different from the other utopias. Lenin believed in what he called the War of Classes, which meant that the ultimate harmony can only be reached after certain groups of people are killed. Initially, when communists come to power, and that doesn't ma matter where, let it be in Russia, in Poland, in, in Cuba, in Nicaragua, it doesn't matter, in China, initially they destroy about 10% of the population, and that's very specific. This is used not just to kill enemies, they're not enemies, it's to restructure the fabric of society. It's a social engineering. Top intellectuals, uh, best workers, best uh, engineers, they will kill them all. Uh, and then uh, they will try to restructure the new society. Hang at least 100 kulaks, execute the hostages, do it in such a way that people for hundreds of miles around will see and tremble. Lenin. In 1917, the communists seized power. Lenin now had a chance to apply Marxism to real life. Those who resisted were shot. There were terrible massacres against resisting peasants. And again, nobody knows uh, exactly how many people died, but we're talking about 10 million or more. But even the most ruthless terror could not break popular resistance, particularly in the ethnic republics, where communist terror was entwined with national oppression, as it was in Ukraine. On September the 11th, 1932, Stalin wrote to his associate, Kaganovich, the situation in Ukraine is very bad. If we don't take steps now, we may lose Ukraine. Several meetings of Stalin's inner circle resulted in a plan of action. It was an horrific plan. In that winter, 32 to 33, uh, all food supplies in the Ukraine were taken away. A huge cordon was um, created so that nobody could, uh, could leave. Initially, people didn't die. Leftover supplies of grain and vegetables kept them alive. But this was not part of Stalin's plan. So he ordered and covered it to confiscate all grain, all food from this series. By doing that, he knew he's condemning them to death. 
картошку, свеклу, э, это самое, капусту, соленая капуста в, это, в, это, в бочке с бочкой. Куда забираешь? Садить же нужно. Нужно вот посадочку, никто не забрать и все. Когда было изъято продовольствие у крестьян, им еще и запретили выезжать, искать его в других местах. Купить, обменять или заработать это продовольствие. And then the hunger began. Причем в города их тоже не пускали, старались не пускать. Там стояли заградительные отряды, которые ссаживали этих умирающих, голодающих с поездов. И некоторые умирали прямо вот на вокзалах или на подъездных путях. Там к Харькову, Киеву. Украинцы были умирали быстро. Children cried agonizingly for bread. Many lost their sense of fear. They went to the NKVD-guarded fields to collect single ears of grain. They were shot on the spot. But most of the victims died slowly, at home. Special NKVD units raided people's homes to collect the dead bodies. They received 200 grams of bread for every dead body they delivered. Она заходит. А кто у вас здесь помер? Давай. Там до одной ночи женщина сама лежит, опухшая, помимо. Так говорит, давай ее сейчас заберем. Что и она все равно помрет завтра за ней еще ехать нужно будет сегодня. Она просит, что да я же еще живу, я жить хочу, я в доме. Скинули з воду, як стану землею закопувати, то я мала не ходила на кладбище, а люди такі вже дорослі ходили. Казали, земля вирушилася, як закриючу землю. Many were buried alive. Это для меня место святое, потому что здесь лежат жертвы Голодомора, в том числе и мои близкие родственники, в частности, моя бабушка. Ten years later, the Nazis will exterminate millions of Jews. They will take away their gold, melt it down, and deposit the bars in Swiss banks. We don't know what communists did with the gold confiscated from these people, and was there any gold? What we do know is what communists did with the grain taken from them. It was exported to the West. Millions upon millions of tons. Despite the famine, the export of Ukrainian grain was increased to the maximum level. The Western media reported both on the scale and character of the famine genocide. Ukrainians were being exterminated in front of the whole world. But the world did nothing to help them. Seven million people were starved to death in the space of one year. Mankind has never seen a more efficient extermination program than the one in Ukraine during the winter of 1932 and 33.
Soviet society was the first communist society on earth. It was a huge social experiment. The agonizing death of seven million Ukrainians had a wider meaning in the distorted vision of the communist architects. You have to uh, make the revolution, then establish the, dictator, uh, the di dict uh, dictatorship of proletariat, and then uh, the, uh, the birth of the new man uh, can be possible. The birth of the new man was the ultimate aim of Marxism, breeding a new evolutionary form of human being who will think, look, and act differently. But communists were not alone in this endeavor. We must a new man to see the world and to a new life. Hitler's National Socialism was also about creating a new man. In both systems you have an ideology which, which has the ambition of uh, creating a new man. That means that both, uh, both systems uh, don't agree with human nature as it is. They are in, at war with nature, with human nature. This is the root of totalitarianism. And you find it both in, in uh, Nazi. In Nazi, it's, a it's an ideology based on false biology, and communism is based on false sociology. But both systems are, uh, have an ambition of being scientific and uh, uh, resting on a scientific basis. The main scientist of Nazism, Alfred Rosenberg, confessed to the Nuremberg Tribunal that Hitler had misused the idea of National Socialism. Indeed, the idea, in the Nazi view, wasn't so bad after all. Healthy, beautiful, blonde and happy people. A future society. And without handicapped, or Jews, nearly a paradise. For some reason, National Socialism did not work out, just as the Soviet Socialism didn't. Both left thousands of mass graves, Millions of murdered people. Was it coincidence? I don't think many people know that um, only socialists publicly advocated genocide in the 19th, 20th centuries. I think that's, that's a very little known fact and, and it seems shocking you mention it. I've, I've lectured on it here and in other universities, and it's always, always greeted with a sense of shock. First appeared in, in January 1849 in, in Marx's journal uh, Neue Rheinische Zeitung. Engels wrote of the uh, how the class war in Marxian terms means that when socialist, socialist revolution happens, the class war happens, uh, there will be primitive societies in Europe uh, two stages behind because they're not even capitalist yet. And he had in mind the Basques and the Bretons and the Scottish Highlanders and the Serbs and uh, uh, he calls them racial trash. Volker Abfeller, racial trash, and they will have to be destroyed because being two stages behind in the historical struggle, it will be impossible to bring them up to the point of being revolutionary. He spoke about the vulgarity and the uh, dirty, dirtiness of, of Slavic people, you see. And uh, he thinks, for instance, that Poland had no, no 
Poland had, had no reason to, to exist. The classes and the races, too weak to master the new conditions of life, must give way. They must perish in the revolutionary Holocaust. Karl Marx. Marx began it. He was the ancestor of, of uh, modern political genocide. And I don't know that any European thinker of the modern period before Marx and Engels ever publicly advocated racial extermination. I can't find anything earlier, so I presume it starts with them. The teachings of Marx and Engels were carefully studied by Lenin, the man who established the first Marxist country on earth. One year after Lenin's death in 1924, the New York Times published a small article, which at the time went almost unnoticed. It was about some newly established party in Germany. The National Socialist Labour Party, of which Adolf Hitler is patron and father, persists in believing that Lenin and Hitler can be compared. Who's speaking? A certain Dr. Goebbels. On the speaker's assertion that Lenin was the greatest man, second only to Hitler, and that the difference between communism and the Hitler faith was very slight, a faction war opened with whizzing beer glasses. Amazing. The future Nazi propaganda minister Goebbels was openly declaring that the difference between Lenin's communism and the Hitler faith was very slight. As we read, it didn't go down well with potential voters, so the Nazis changed their tactics. Their early campaign posters quietly disappeared. They never again publicly stressed their resemblance to communists. In the inner circle, however, the Nazis and Hitler were more outspoken. Hitler often said that, uh, that he had learned a great deal from Marxism, from reading Marx, I mean. Uh, the whole of National Socialism is based upon it, he said, meaning doctrinally based. Uh, people keep forgetting uh, that Nazi regime in Germany was also socialist. It was, they officially were called the uh, National Socialist Workers' Party. So it's a branch of socialism. The Soviets were international socialists, and th those were, in Germany, national socialists. So it's the same thing in reality, only slightly different interpretation. <laughs> Part of the left uh, went to Hitler, uh, at least in France, part of the socialists went to, to became uh, advocates of uh, Hitler. The popular British playwright Bernard Shaw supported Hitler in the mass media. The left supported Hitler not because he deceived them. They knew Hitler would kill. He said he would. In fact, it was why they supported him. You must all know half a dozen people at least who are no use in this world, who are more trouble than they are worth. Just put them there and say, sir or madam, now will you be kind enough to justify your existence? If you can't justify your existence, if you're not pulling your weight in the social boat, if you're not producing as much as you consume, or perhaps a little more, then at 
clearly, we cannot use the big organization of our society for the purpose of keeping you alive, because your life does not benefit us, and it can't be of very much use to yourself. Bernard believed in, the, in uh, masculine by category, not usually by racial category, but by category, you know, the idle, the unfit. Killing off the parasites within society was what Marxian socialism was about. It demanded in a, in a London newspaper that the scientists should devise a humane gas. I appeal to the chemists to discover a humane gas that will kill instantly and painlessly. Deadly by all means, but humane, not cruel. After 10 years, such gas will be discovered. It will be called Cyclone B. The man who oversaw its practical application, Adolf Eichmann, will later testify that thanks to Cyclone B, people in Auschwitz died without pain. Cyclone B was a humane gas. Yes, Eichmann will use the very same words. It must be said, though, that Bernard Shaw, as well as the left in general, fundamentally opposed Nazism. Because Hitler had distorted Marxism beyond recognition, gassing people based on their nationality was absolutely inexcusable. The selection should be based on class. Hitler got it all wrong. Absolutely different people needed to be killed. The only true Marxist country on earth was the Soviet Union. It exterminated strictly according to Marx's teaching, the class enemies. In general, the process was pretty similar to the extermination of the Jews. First, the victims were ridiculed and publicly humiliated. And then they were killed. Millions of them. If the enemy does not give up, it must be exterminated. В 30-е годы была заведена вся эта отработана вся эта технология расстрелов и убийств. Значит, практически каждая область, вот административная область, имела свою зону, где значит, захоранивали этих расстрелянных. The shooting itself was carried out in prisons. In the basements there were special shooting chambers with concrete walls and with a runnel to channel blood. Человека вели по коридору там в красный уголок, в красном уголке последнее, значит, э, с лечения персональных данных. Он должен был назвать свою фамилию, имя, отчество. Вот потом, значит, его выводили, заводили в эту комнату, и как только он переступал там порог, он получал выстрел в затылок из пистолета. Yes, people were killed by a bullet in the head. Uh... We know that usually they were killed by bunches of, well, um, between 100 and sometimes, well, several hundreds every, well, night. Then the corpses were loaded onto trucks, driven out of towns and buried in nearby forests and parks. This is Bakivina Forest near Kiev. The elderly people will never forget the trucks which were driving here during the night. Blood was dripping from them en route. Only after 50 years, the relatives were allowed to come here. They created this memorial where monuments are trees. Each tree in this forest is banded with a scarf in memory of the innocent victims who were brutally murdered and dumped into mass graves here.
Bikivna, Butovo, Leningrad, Vinitsa, Kharkov. Mass graves littered the whole country. A whole generation of children lost their parents and became homeless, or so-called besprizonia. Millions of them were begging for bread in the streets of Soviet cities. It was an embarrassing sight, especially if foreign friends came to visit Moscow. And Stalin tackled this problem. Stalin uh, authorized in the middle of the 30s uh, because there was this problem of besprizorni. He authorized the uh, children to be shot from the age of 12. People were being shot um, day and night throughout the biggest country in the world. And Stalin even got to the point of killing people by random, by quarters. Let's say 100,000 in uh, Tambov district. OK, that's it. Whoever they grabbed and shot will be fulfilling quota. They wouldn't care about names. Then after the quotas were fulfilled, the local authorities would report to Stalin, to Central Committee, and ask uh, for additional quotas. Khrushchev просил, что лимит вот значит там что-то ему там разрешалось что-то семь или восемь тысяч врагов народа. Он просил, дайте мне лимит на семнадцать тысяч. An additional quota will be given, and after fulfilling, they would again ask for additional quota, and so it will go in circles. It was like a like, like mincemeat machine, you know. It was just killing and killing and killing. Stalin, как человек, у которого весь в крови. Я все это видел его резолюции, когда пачками он подписывал вместе с Молотом, Ворошиловым, Кагановичем, Ждановым. Это самая пятерка была инициативная. Молотов всегда добавлял заменить 10 лет на расстрел. Пачки. И в результате вот только за эти с 1937 -го года по 1941 11 миллионов человек. 11 миллионов. Можете себе представить, какие масштабы репрессий своего народа? There was a man in Europe who was closely following the situation in Russia, Hitler. To kill millions of people in such a short time was truly remarkable. Holocaust was as yet only an idea in Hitler's head. Hitler's distorted vision of the world began to take a real shape. He annexed Austria, occupied Czechoslovakia. It became clear to everyone, to avoid a global catastrophe, Hitler had to be stopped. But Stalin refused to join the anti-Hitlerian coalition. Their idea was to destroy old order in Europe. 
And that was Stalin's big idea. Let Hitler be a bad guy. He will go and destroy all the order in Europe. There will be no parliaments, no trade unions, no armies, no governments. And then Stalin will come as a liberator. Liberator. Millions of people will be sitting in concentration camps, hoping for someone to liberate them. And Stalin and the Red Army will come as a liberator. That was his plan. But Hitler had neither the resources nor the secure rear borders to wage a large-scale war. So, on August the 23rd, 1939, Hitler and Stalin sign a pact, which provides Germany with a secure eastern border and huge supplies of strategic resources to be provided in later economic agreements. On August the 24th, the Nazi Foreign Minister Ribbentrop reports to Hitler on his visit to Moscow. Hitler rejoices. Now he has everything he needs to start the World War. September 1st, 1939. Hitler attacks Poland from the west. Poland is desperately resisting the Nazis. But then, on September the 17th, Poland is unexpectedly attacked from the east by the Soviet Union. Действия, которые совершил э, советское руководство, э, отдав приказ о, о вторжении на территорию Польши, э, согласно всем нормам международного права, не могут э, расцениваться никак иначе, как, так сказать, совершение агрессии. Luftwaffe bombers were attacking Polish cities, and the Soviet radio transmitter in Minsk guided them to their targets. The Red Army looked different then. It entered the Second World War side by side with the SS. Local populations sometimes could not tell the difference between the two. So, to be sure, they addressed both. The German army met the Red Army in the middle of Poland. And then the two totalitarian monsters, Soviet and German, divided the country between them. The Soviet press depicted the whole thing as a fight against Polish fascism. The peace-loving Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union were fighting aggressive Polish fascism. What the world did not know was that both dictators had agreed on more than Poland. In a secret protocol signed in the Kremlin a week before the war started, Hitler and Stalin agreed on the division of Europe. Сначала в этом проекте, который предлагал Репентроп, этого не было. И вот как ни странно, как ни странно, инициатором составления вот этого тайного дополнительного договора был Сталин сам. Мы отрицали, понимаете, потому что он настолько, как говорится, агрессивный, что это не к лицу коммунистической партии, и отрицали, что не было такого до, до последнего дня все время отрицали. By this secret protocol, Hitler gave the green light for Stalin to occupy a number of European countries. The first on the list was Finland. When the first bomber planes came to bomb Helsinki, you know, the, the, the autumn, uh, November 39, Finns thought that uh, those um, Russian bomber planes were, were lost, simply that they were bombing Helsinki by accident. Again the Russian bombers zoom over Helsinki. Again a proud city is shaken by the roar of destruction. Just feel your own heart beating faster as you see the buildings falling under the impact of the bombs. Moscow labelled Finland a fascist regime and launched a massive ground attack. It was 
was a disaster. Russians lost a third of a million dead, frozen and wounded. Tiny Finland was miraculously holding back the world's largest army. But it was at an enormous cost. My father lost uh, four of his brothers in that war. Four. That's a lot in one family. That was the price we paid, that we did not have a democratic society next to us. Finland's flag is still flying. Though she may pass through the valley of sorrow, though she may lose her liberty and her land, she fights on. Yet another air raid on Helsinki. This time, the Catholic catches the horror these dastardly attacks bring into the lives of the children as they dash terror-stricken to the shelter. People cowering against a wall for safety from aerial death. This is the mark of warfare against women and children. As the Russians retreat from the Arctic villages, even if they can't win, they can still burn and destroy. For its brutal aggression against Finland, the USSR was expelled from the League of Nations. The Kremlin's rhetoric about a fight against Finnish fascism was not taken seriously. Only three countries had previously been labeled as aggressors by the League. Militaristic Japan, Fascist Italy, and Nazi Germany. Now they were joined by the Soviet Union. In Europe, the Soviet Union had only one ally left, Hitler. Hitler launched his blitzkrieg in the West. Nazis occupied Denmark, Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg. Norway was invaded with the direct help of the Soviet Union. Stalin provided the Nazis with a Soviet naval base near Murmansk, from which Hitler launched his attack on Norway. Когда было принято в Берлине решение о прекращении использования этой базы, то было направлено соответствующее благодарственное письмо адмирала Редера, наркому военно-морского флота Кузнецова с выражением большой благодарности за услуги, оказанные германскому военно-морскому флоту. Сталин wrote to the Nazi foreign minister Ribbentrop, the friendship between Germany and the Soviet Union was sealed by blood. Apparently, he meant the blood of the Soviet and Nazi victims. And friendship it was. Soviet and Nazi officers were meeting and discussing the progress of the war. This is December 1939. The progress was good, and the prospects looked even better. There was reason to celebrate. The Soviet Union became the main supplier of resources for the Nazi war machine. Thousands of tons of oil, iron ore, construction materials. Even trainloads of Soviet grain were sent to the German army. Soviet citizens were starving but their government was sending food to Hitler. The Soviet Union went even further. It persuaded the communist parties of Europe to sabotage the resistance movement and to support the Nazis. Comforting to see Parisian workers talking to German soldiers as friends in the street or at the corner cafe. Well done, comrades, and keep it up. Even if it displeases the, the middle classes, the brotherhood of man will not remain forever a hope. It will become a living reality. That is the French Communist Party in, in July 1940. Communist Party 
say today that they, they, they were resistant well before the June 19, 1941 when Soviet Union was attacked. In fact, they, they were uh, they, they were in, in fight with the uh, Maréchal Pétain's government more than the, the German. In June 1940, Hitler crushed France. Stalin, meanwhile, occupied Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia. The only country in Europe still resisting Hitler was Great Britain. If Great Britain goes down, the Axis powers will control the continents of Europe and Asia and Africa and Australasia and the high seas. And they will be in a position to bring enormous military and naval resources against this hemisphere. The US President Roosevelt regarded the Soviet Union as an Axis power. It was evident to everyone Stalin was in the fascist camp. Soviet Premier Molotov went to Berlin to discuss the post-war world order. He arrived with a list of territories the USSR was interested in. While Hitler and Molotov were discussing it, the other Soviet comrades enjoyed the company of Goebbels, who must have talked about the advantages of Nazism, because it was the Soviet Premier Molotov and not Goebbels who warned the West not to fight Nazi ideology. More than that, in his address to the Supreme Soviet in the Kremlin, Molotov declared that fighting Nazi ideology was actually a crime. It was published in all the largest Soviet newspapers. Later, that page will disappear from the public libraries of the USSR, along with many other pro-Nazi statements of the Soviet government. But why was fighting Nazism a crime in the Soviet view? Because mass killings and concentration camps were based on that ideology. Work makes you free, the Nazi camps. Work is an honor, the Soviet camps. If someone wanted to fight the ideology behind it, he would end up fighting the Soviet regime too. Molotov knew it. After all, he was the one who personally monitored the extermination of seven million Ukrainians. Himmler monitored extermination of Jews. Both men agreed that for the common good, certain groups simply needed to be killed. Winston Churchill made no secret that to him, Nazi and communist ideologies were pretty similar. In his view, Nazism was a form of communist despotism. The hateful communist despotism, as Churchill called it in 1940, eventually won, with the help of the Allies. Here, it is celebrated, the 60th anniversary of the great victory, an historical parade, no less historical than the first Soviet victory parade in World War II, together with the Nazis. Die kommandierenden Generale der deutschen und sowjetrussischen Truppen nahmen gemeinsam den Vorbeimarsch ihrer Formationen ab. The Soviets never emphasized that they were parading under the Nazi flag. Officially, Moscow portrayed itself as an epic anti-fascist fighter. Many people believed it. 
Many Jews fled to the USSR to be protected from Hitler. And then, Stalin did something unimaginable. He rounded them up and delivered them back to the Gestapo as a gesture of friendship. Take a look at this footage again. The Soviet officer greeting his SS colleagues with a Nazi salute. The uh, Nazi SS and the Soviet NKVD, you know, the Stalin security police, cooperated very closely. Archive documents reveal the enormous scale of this cooperation. Lists and lists of German communists and Jews, which Soviets were delivering to the Nazis. December 1937, April 1938, May 1938, November 1938. Most of these people perished in Nazi concentration camps. But the SS-NKVD partnership was not limited to the extradition of common enemies. NKVD was training Gestapo. The Soviet machinery of terror had been operating for 20 years before the, the Nazis even started. Delegation uh, German Gestapo SS приезжает в Советский Союз учиться, как строить концлагеря. Посещали концлагеря, как это нужно, как огораживать, как ставить. The Soviet officers, in turn, went to Nazi-occupied Krakow to meet with their SS colleagues. The Jewish question was high on the meeting's agenda. Soviet officials coordinated the deportation of Jews personally with the SS Brigadeführer Otto Wächter, one of the masterminds of the Holocaust. He moved the Jews to the Krakow ghetto and later arranged their extermination in gas chambers. The fact that the Soviets collaborated with the SS is not denied by Russia anymore. What is still denied is that this collaboration was based on a written agreement. Рейсфюр СС, начальник Главного управления безопасности, Берлин, 3 ноября 1938 года. На основании этой доверенности мой представитель штандартный фюр СС Генрих Мюллер имеет поручение подписать в Москве с руководством органов безопасности Советского Союза соглашение о совместной деятельности между НКВД и Генеральным управлением безопасности Германии, на которое мы возлагаем большие надежды, подчеркнуто два раза рукой Берии, связанные с укреплением мира и безопасности между нашими странами. Гробл фюр СС Гейдрих, подпись. Мамулов. Мамулов. Мамулов, да? Мамулов это да. самое. Это здесь, Мамулов, здесь приобщите к основному документу Лаврентий Берия. Подпись личная. This document was smuggled out of the presidential archive in Moscow by one of its workers. It was shown on Russian television. Later, this footage disappeared from the TV archive. Ты хотя бы почитай, что внутри. Я сейчас, сейчас. Ну вот давай обсуждать, потому что эта страна должна знать, потому что это геноцид. Потому что 20 миллионов жизней отдали за то... Unlike the official Kremlin, the former Soviet officials who had access to the Central Committee, now presidential, archive, affirm the existence of such an agreement. Vladimir Karpov, former military intelligence colonel, two times hero of the Soviet Union, member of the Central Committee, the top Soviet leadership council, Convoys bringing in the entire Politburo and party bosses from every corner of the country. This man, Vladimir Karpov, said that so many problems had now mounted up that the way things were run had to be changed. 
we spoke with Mr. Karpov in his Moscow apartment in Kutuzovsky Prospect 26, the house of the former KGB chief Andropov and the Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev. Был заключен тайный договор между КГБ и НКВД, тогда называлось НКВД и Гестапо о сотрудничестве. Тоже меня, значит, обвинили, что это чепуха, и такого не могло быть. Мы интернационалисты, мы не могли, значит, заключить такой договор. Вот это совершенно противоречие между тем, что сталинский режим – преступный режим, а во внешнеполитической области вроде и не преступный. Понимаете? Тут, если он преступный режим, он во всех областях действует преступно. В том числе и во внешнеполитическом. И это надо признать раз и навсегда. But Moscow does not accept it. It does not accept the criminal nature of the Soviet regime. Any documents revealing it are usually declared fake, like the secret protocol dividing Europe. Interestingly, in this case, the Kremlin's denial is supported by one Western historian, David Irving, more famous for his denial of the Holocaust. But why would he deny the authenticity of this agreement? We can only guess. A quote from the document. Органы НКВД возлагают на себя обязательство предложить советскому правительству программу по отстранению лиц еврейской национальности от органов власти о запрещении использовать евреев и лиц, произошедших от браков с евреями в области культуры и образования. Вот, вот подписи. Начальник главного управления государственной безопасности Народного комиссариата Берия и представитель начальника главного управления безопасности Германии Штандартенфюрер СС Мюллер. Вот его подписи, вот печать. Sounds quite shocking. But what is more shocking is that in today's Russia, these actions of Stalin are still being justified at the highest level. The former defense minister of Russia, Igor Radionov. Это была война, настоящая война. Это была война с еврейским фашизмом внутри государства. Radionov is just one of many in Russia today who believe that helping Hitler to fight Jews in the 1930s was actually a noble fight against fascism, Jewish fascism, as it is now called in Russia. In 1939, Stalin sacked his longtime foreign minister, Litvinov. Дело в том, что Литвинов действительно был по причине своей еврейской национальности, но крайне неподходящим для подписания любого пакта с Германией. And Litvinov was removed. The Soviet foreign ministry was surrounded by NKVD troops, tanks. And Stalin uh, gave the order, clear out the synagogue, which is not a very nice thing to say. Um, you would expect this from, from Hitler. Uh, but Stalin equally was capable of, uh, of such pre prejudice. The exiled communist leader Lev Trotsky warned the world about Stalin's anti-Semitism and about the fact that Stalin and Hitler were colluding. Stalin's police, the GPU, has fallen to the level of the Nazi Gestapo. His outspokenness was becoming dangerous to the Kremlin. Trotsky was aware that his every speech could be the last. He knew that Stalin was after him. But even in his worst dreams, he could not imagine that his death will be so agonizing. Stalin sent a secret agent to Mexico. He glided into Trotsky's house and smashed him in the head with an alpine axe. Trotsky fought for his life for two days and then died in horrible pain. In Stalin's time, critics of the Kremlin were not argued with they were killed. The Soviet Union, like Nazi Germany, did not just commit criminal acts, it was a criminal enterprise in its very essence. 
To become a member of Stalin's Politburo, one had to take responsibility for murder. To be trusted, like in a criminal gang. Stalin rarely signed execution orders alone. The other Politburo members also had to put their signatures on the death lists. Even those who later condemned Stalin were responsible for mass murder themselves. Comrades were united by common crimes. There was no way back for them, but to commit new crimes. In March 1940, in a forest near Katyn village, eight huge pits were dug. Heavy trucks brought in people. They were Polish army reservists, doctors, engineers, teachers. They were ordered to get out. No one was supposed to see what happened next, but the noise of trucks deep in the forest seemed unusual to the forester. He was locked in for 25 years, incommunicado, under a false name. They could have killed him for some reason they didn't. I don't know why. Uh, so they just kept him in jail, and that's a very well-known, documented fact. And what did he see? What did he... he saw NKVD shooting them. A big uh, hole, and NKVD shooting through the back of the neck, each of them. The people were tied up with his hands behind, on their knees, in, on the edge of, the, of that hole. Just shot and kicked into the hole. Политбюро ЦК ВКПБ приняло решение всех этих военнопленных из этих трех специальных лагерей расстрелять. The Katyn massacre was the first mass execution of this scale in World War II. Nazis will follow suit only later. Mass murder in Katyn unleashed the industrial killing, which will soon turn World War II into the most bloody carnage in human history. the Soviets carried out massacres on a regular basis. Riga, Tartu, Lviv, Minsk. Relatives could not identify many of the corpses. Horrific torture had made them unrecognizable. The Soviet Union, meanwhile, had become an allied power. The Soviet officers who pulled out fingernails, cut tongues, and perforated the skulls of their victims with nails were paid with Western aid. The British War Crimes Act gives them immunity from persecution in Britain because war crimes, by definition, were committed only by the Germans. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word, victory. Victory at all costs. The entire Western world has lived for 60 years on the assumption that all crimes were Nazi crimes, and it's very difficult to change it. Whether Europe will ever come to terms with this um, criminal part of its past is difficult to know. But mass killing is mass killing. Um, there should be no distinction between one side and the other. And yet there is.
the Soviet officers who shot more than 20,000 unarmed people were decorated. Майор Супруненко, который расстреливал в Катыни, получил э, тогда ниш, низший орден, который был, это знак почета, э, трудовой орден, ну там же работа же. А Серов, который потом был председателем КГБ, он за расстрел польских офицеров получил орден Ленина. Это была высшая государственная награда. World War II left more than 27 million Soviet citizens dead. The Communist Party always tried to decrease that number. Why? Because only a fraction of them were killed by the Germans. You have to remember that uh, when the Red Army marched, behind the Red Army was a second army, the NKVD army, which had its own tanks, its own machine guns and so on, firing forward so that nobody could move back. Когда пришли наши, то специальные части снимали жетоны с наших солдат. Viktor Baturin, chairman of the Russian Military History Association, tells the shocking story of how, after major battles, special Soviet units raided battlefields and tore the dog tags off the dead Soviet soldiers to make them unidentifiable. No other country in the world has treated its war dead in this way. Due to the appalling policies of the Soviet authorities, more than a million Soviet citizens joined the Nazi side. <laughs> Вождю и главнокомандующему всех освободительных армий Адольфу Гитлеру. They were turned against their own people. Those who refused were ruthlessly dealt with by the Nazi collaborators. А если среди нас найдутся шкурники или провокаторы, то мы сами беспощадно расправимся с ними. The Great Patriotic War was drawing to the close. Stalin was at the height of his glory. He knew quite well that nobody would ever judge the vanquisher of Hitler. So at the end of the war, he carried out some of his most horrible crimes. Stalin uh, exiled about a dozen of nations completely, part and parcel, young and old. Uh, women and men, uh, even members of the Communist Party among them. They were all exiled to Central Asia, to Kazakhstan, Chechens, Ingush, Kalmyks, Karachayevs, uh, uh, Crimean Tartars, a dozen of nations completely wiped out. The Soviet deportations, although on a much bigger scale, were similar to um, deportations by the SS. The descriptions are just horrific. 60, 70 people in, in a closed cattle truck uh, with no sanitary pro provisions, just a hole in the floor, packed so tightly that they, they had to stand up. They couldn't sit down. And when the train stopped, they would unload hundreds of corpses of people who died on the way. And there, there were trees, there were trees. Ragu <laughs>
1945, the Allies defeated Hitler. This horrible film footage was shown in the West, a Nazi concentration camp after liberation. But only a few understood what they were actually seeing. The site was being cleared for new inmates. The Soviets did not destroy the Nazi camps. They continued to use them after the war. The agreement which uh, Stalin made with the West affected the whole of Europe for the next 50 years. So although you can say the crimes are of the same order, um, the, the political outcome at the end of the Second World War quite clearly was very different for those two dictatorships. And it was also very different for the people of Western and Eastern Europe. The Soviet Union transferred a lot of ethnic Russians into the occupied Baltic countries. It was a clear violation of Geneva Convention, which forbids the transfer of civilians into the occupied countries. Uh, for example, in 1945, it was a case of my grandparents' family, which were forced by Soviet officers at the gunpoint. Uh, out of their apartments. Afterwards, uh, the Soviet officers settled there with their families. The Kremlin strategically orchestrated ethnic cleansing in the Baltics, so that the Russian settlers became a majority in all the largest Baltic cities. Estonians, Latvians and Lithuanians were loaded onto cattle trucks and deported to Siberia. The tiny Baltic nations were brought to the brink of extinction. Deportations, executions and torture became the post-war reality for millions of people. Concentration camps were scattered throughout both Europe and Siberia. In many of them, horrific medical experiments were performed on humans. In Butugichag camp in Magadan, the KGB used thousands of prisoners as guinea pigs, experimenting with the human brain. Many of these prisoners were still alive during the experiments. All of this happened after Nazism was defeated and memorials made to its victims. The victims of the Soviet death camps were buried in numbered graves. There is no memorial here, just a pile of the shoes of murdered victims, children's shoes among them. Feeling complete impunity, the post-war KGB terrorized the population, letting loose their most beastly instincts. Mēs izgājām ārā, un tur pie verandas bija liela asina spēļķi. Nu, tās asinas savācām stikla burkā, jo tā bija mūsu tēvu dzīvība. Man ir grūtas tās dīna, man tā kā... Man tā kā uzblēst ir jauna rēta un tāda, ka lasiņo. This was drawn by a KGB prison guard who had served for 33 years in the Soviet interior system. He was depicting his routine, everyday life. Who were these men who were doing these atrocities? Meet one of them the notorious Janis Zinters. 
a KGB interrogator in the Soviet-occupied Latvia. He was particularly famous for his brutality towards women. The victim's testimonies paint an horrific picture of his interrogations. Female victims were beaten and tortured by several KGB officers continuously for 20 hours. Not everyone could endure it. The wife of Ernest Waltman, Veronika, was beaten and tortured by Zintars and his drunk colleagues for four days. She finally committed suicide by hanging herself in the prison cell. When the Soviet Union collapsed, Zintars fled to Russia. The Kremlin refuses to extradite him, calling him an honorable veteran. With the hands of these KGB veterans, the Soviet Union terrorized and tortured innocent people. They were the ones who guarded death camps, where millions were exterminated and thousands used in horrific medical experiments. Many of these death camp veterans are still alive. Unlike their SS colleagues, they are proud of what they did. They are proud of the Soviet Union, which let them do it. Прежде всего следует признать, и об этом я уже говорил, что крушение Советского Союза было крупнейшей геополитической катастрофой века. Крупнейшей геополитической катастрофой века. Никому не хочется сознавать, что твои как бы предки были преступниками банальными. Я думаю, в этом дело. I think that Russia, as a successor of the Soviet Union, is obliged to carry out a real investigation of all the crimes and the character of their system. And I think up to now. They are not ready and not able to do it. Under Gorbachev and Yeltsin, the crimes of the Soviet Union were at least not advertised. Under President uh, Putin, we see a very different approach. Uh, the idea that uh, Russia continues, in a sense, uh, in, uh, in the footsteps of the Soviet Union, and any attack on the Soviet Union is an attack on modern Russia. The Russian identity has been shaped up by the sense of, of being part of a big empire. When they lost the empire, they couldn't uh, record, remain the same. But this destruction, national degradation, what was in Germany after the First World War and after the collapse, Это огромная питательная почва для э, вот этих вот новых нацистов, понимаете? Это как раз то, что было э, э, и дало всплеск в Германии к, к фашизму. Со времен прихода Путина к власти, практически с конца 90-х годов, с началом Второй Чеченской войны, идет массовая ксенофобская пропаганда сверху. И у людей, в общем-то, появляется такая ненависть к инородцам, людям другого языка, другой веры, к другим странам. The former Russian defense minister Radionov again. Практически все российские СМИ работают против России и народа, так как находится в руках еврейской мафии. And the next speaker is Mr. Rogozin of Russia. Mr. Rogozin, you have the floor. Я работаю в Федеральном собрании России. Mr. Rogozin led the Russian delegation in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, where he repeatedly voiced his concern about the rebirth of fascism in Europe. At home, his agenda was a little different. The pre-election clip of his party. Подними и бери с собой. Ты русский язык, понимаешь? 
Let's rid Moscow of trash. Депутат Куринович, пожалуйста, вам слово. Я депутат Государственной Думы, фракция ЛДПР Куринович Николай Владимирович, член комитета по безопасности. Хотел бы в своем лице приветствовать всех национал-патриотов России. Слава России! The Nazi salute in the Parliament of Russia. If you think it can't go any further, you would be wrong. This shocking video is one of hundreds published on the website of the Russian National Socialists. When it made it to the front pages of the world media, the Russian authorities finally closed the Nazi site, declaring it American provocation. The whole thing was turned into farce, questioning the genuineness of the video. Unfortunately, the murders captured on these videos turn out to be genuine. Hundreds of them every year, all over Russia. And the grief of the loved ones is also unspeakably genuine. Turning human tragedy into a farce has become a norm in Russia. Ridiculing the Ukrainian famine or the Jewish Holocaust is the norm. Because killing can be justified, especially if it cleanses society. The killers become heroes. Mass murderers are decorated veterans. Young people are taught that the crimes these people have committed against humanity are heroic deeds. It is no surprise that these crimes are replicated. Europe now has the opportunity to condemn these crimes and to demand the extradition of those who committed them. Yet Europe hesitates. Why? One knows what Europe, uh, how we depend on uh, so yeah, Russian gas, petrol. So I think it's a political not well. We, we know exactly why Europe uh, doesn't, well, cannot um, um, oppose Russia on so many issues. Uh, unfortunately, Europe continues uh, ignore uh, Soviet crimes, mass murders, uh, while millions of the victims uh, are neglected by Europe. Uh, there is a an equal right for all the victims to see those who committed crimes, to, to see them tried and, and, and sentenced. But this is not how the world works. And, um, for example, in, in the case of Katyn, uh, it's now known very well the names and addresses of many of the Soviet officers who perpetrated those crimes, who shot people in cold blood. Uh, yet if there was ever an investigation, those murderers should come to Great Britain because they'll be safe, because in this country it's not regarded as a war crime. And the other Soviet crimes are not regarded as crimes either. Their victims are quietly passing away, receiving no comfort, no justice. In the European Union,
that is reserved for other victims. Looking at this grey monument in the very centre of Europe, one can't help thinking that it stands here because, deep in their hearts, many Europeans still believe in what these two men so persistently maintained. That when inferior nations are being killed, it cannot be seen as a crime, because it makes way for the more advanced nations to build a better life. While this idea is alive, and while the spectre of these two men is haunting Europe, it will be very hard for its various nations to be truly united. The Soviet authorities are extraordinarily ruthless in the categories of people uh, they uh, destroyed. Um, they didn't destroy uh, opposition, or uh, they destroyed categories of people. It was a really social engineering aimed at the elimination of large segments not of party members, but of uh, peasants, workers, um, members of ethnic minorities. That's uh, it's a social Darwinism, uh, which is which you find both in communism and in Nazism. It's the idea, and I think it's one of also of the roots of totalitarianism, social Darwinism. That means the less apt must be must be destroyed. It's the bourgeoisie, or it's uh, you know the Jews, or uh, other. It's the same kind of reasoning. The Soviets removed not only a person they um, objected to, but the entire family. Um, so that women, children, grandfathers, grandmothers of, should we say, a. Um, a Zionist leader or a 
Polish socialist leader, would be exiled to distant Siberia and uh, the uh, particular object of, of removal would go to, go to the Gulag. The first death uh, camps, the first extermination camps, I suppose in all human history, in modern history certainly, were set up by Lenin uh, in 1918. And uh, the, the pace intensified in the 20s and 30s. Stalin, uh, when he became ruler in the, in the mid-20s, uh, uh, greatly intensified uh, the pro program. And we also know that uh, their techniques were studied. But they weren't studied by the Germans in order to be uh, simply imitated. They were studied to be improved. And that is what the, the Germans did. Uh, the, Nazi, the Soviet system was chaotic, like everything sovietical. It was a mess. And uh, the Germans would only have to take one look at it to see if they could do it better, and they did do it better. Uh, they, had a, they had a more efficient uh, uh, forces. Uh, they, they knew how to, to run a camp and how to uh, dispose of corpses uh, at a faster rate, and that is what they did. And KVD would be teaching Gestapo directly how to do that. This is why, for example, the execution of uh, Polish officers at Katyn was so difficult to identify who did that, because the method was the same, both uh, uh, practiced by NKVD and by Gestapo. So, uh, difficult to say. Uh, the Soviets have started earlier. Germans were still uh, Weimar Republic uh, when the Soviets already invented concentration camps, uh, extermination camps. Uh, they invented uh, what uh, used to be called later Dushegubka, when a closed uh, van, where prisoners are, uh, are transported, would have the outlet of exhaust pipe inside, and exhaust gas, uh, gas would kill uh, the prisoners. So by the time they arrived, there were already be, been corpses, you know. That was invented in the Soviet Union in the early 30s, and Germans simply learned it from the Soviets. Uh, and everyone blames Germans now for this uh, invention, whereas it was invented by the Soviets. When I was first in, in Eastern Europe, in, which was in 1957, it was forbidden uh, to describe uh, the uh, uh, Nazi camps in, in the Polish press, the Polish communist press, because the resemblances between such camps and what the Soviets were known to be doing at that time was so close that everybody would see it to be there. So there was a ban on reports of Nazi atrocities in, 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 the, in the Polish, Polish press uh, under Stalin. The trouble is that most British and American people are not aware of it. Uh, they're not aware of uh, either the scale or the nature of crimes committed uh, by the Soviet Union, by the Red Army, but especially by the NKVD. Uh, in their minds, these things are very vague, if they exist at all. This was not a, an accidental famine through the failure of of the climate, or that it was a deliberate political act. Over six million um, victims and demographic and uh, political uh, major event of pre-war European history. And of course it can be only compared by the masses of, um, of uh, deaths. To, uh, a, to the two main genocides of 20th century Europe, the Armenian one, 1915, and then, of course, the uh, Holocaust. It, it's proven now with the opening of the archives that Stalin knew perfectly what was happening and he, he deliberately uh, augmented, uh, you know, the, uh, how do you say, the requisition of... Uh, of, of grain in Ukraine, knowing that it would lead to, to, to the destruction of a, 
an important part of the population, so it was a deliberate crime. Lots of Westerners went to the Soviet Union um, and thought it was a wonderful place. They believed naively everything they were told. Um, uh, a fine example was um, uh, Sidney and Beatrice Webb, leaders of the um, British Socialist Fabian movement, driving uh, by train through Ukraine during the famine and seeing starving people on the, uh, the station and being told, ah, these are Soviet workers waiting to go on holiday. And uh, uh, Beatrice Webb heard, heard her out and uh, she said, very bad stage management. The English are so sentimental. In other words, they should not have let you see or hear what was happening. And, uh, and the, the visitor said, but Mrs. Webb, they were starving. They were crying for bread. And, uh, uh, and Beatrice Webb said, uh, you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs. So the, the Webbs did know that the Soviet state, which they had publicly supported, was exterminatory. They did know. And what's more, they supported it. One or two people, like Malcolm Muggeridge, who was a British journalist, uh, saw it and came back and told the truth, but um, many people didn't believe him. Uh, other journalists, like Walter Durante, who was the um, correspondent of the New York Times, um, sent deliberately false reports to the United States, probably because he was being blackmailed. But he was given a Pulitzer Prize for these descriptions of the wonderful conditions in, in Ukraine. So in reality, uh, it was known. But of course, a big segment of uh, political establishment in the West didn't want to know it. So they pretended it, it's not proven. Well, who cares? One guy says that, another guy says no. So we don't know, probably not. But that was an attitude of the West. Тут все есть, да? Uh -huh. Это народный комиссариат. Uh -huh. да. да, вот, вот такая печать. Мюллер, Берия. Вы знаете, это, конечно, ошеломляющее, то, что я сейчас увидел. Речь идет о каком-то соглашении между Главным управлением государственной безопасности и э, гестапо. Я не специалист в этой области, я не могу сказать, насколько это так или не так, но э, так как оформлены эти документы, эти печати, которые там, конечно, э, заставляют меня серьезно отнестись э, к тому, что я увидел. Значит, нельзя сказать со стопроцентной э, сказать, уверенностью, что подлинные документы, не подлинные, по телевизионной записи. Но оформление документов, подписи, бери, резолюции, штампы, то, что видно, еще раз и еще раз заставляет меня сказать, что к этому надо относиться очень серьезно. Вам обязательно надо показывать это в Федеральной службе безопасности. Потому что материалы Главного управления государственной безопасности хранились и хранятся в Федеральной службе безопасности. Я все-таки, ну, ладно, это я так уже, но все я доволен. Я, я уверен просто, что э, ФСБ не даст ответ, что это подделка, там, они никогда не признают. Делать это будет очень трудно.
знаете, может быть, это и не ФСБ. Видите, он у вас там говорит, что он с президентом рядом и все такое. И я не исключаю. Да, я не исключаю, что, может быть, это материалы, предположим, архива президента. Ведь архив Политбюро, да, Сталинского Политбюро, долгие годы хранится, и часть его значительная продолжает храниться в архиве президента. Еще а могут ли такие документы храниться в какой-то личной коллекции? Никогда. Абсолютно исключено. Но вы понимаете, ну, все мы выросли в Советском Союзе, да, и после Советского Союза. Это документы строго учетные. Эти документы зафиксированы в многих других документах. То есть они ни в каких частных коллекциях быть не могут. Это явно акт какого-то хищения. Что он, видимо, имеет доступ, может быть, к каким-то этим документам. Кто это, я не знаю. Но то, что вы должны обратиться в Федеральную службу безопасности, это абсолютно точно. Так, а... чем, чем быстрее вы это сделаете, тем лучше. Это серьезное преступление, если он вынес эти документы. The official slogan was the Frenchman shouldn't fight for the interests of the city. The capitalism. Yeah. So they were uh, conducting propaganda, deficit propaganda in, in, in France, saying that Frenchmen shouldn't resist uh, uh, Germans. And communists were perceived as anti-Nazis at the end of the war. They did take part in resistance, that's true. But the initial stages when they were co collaborating with Uh, Germans. That was for forgotten during the war. Their first, uh, uh, their first attitude was to to try to collaborate, and uh, they asked, they asked the um, to the German authority uh, here in Paris, the authorization of uh, public to pub to publish their daily l'humanité, and uh, a book. Uh, uh, has just uh, been published in France about that question. No, nothing new, uh, except one thing, very important. Uh, the, author, the authors uh, discovered uh, uh, the paper which prepared the, the discussion between the delegation of the communists and uh, the, 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 the German authority. And uh, one of the, uh, the arguments they give is that uh, they have the same conception, the same way uh, of treating the Jew. Uh, at each word, uh, at each, not word, at each, each name uh, uh, of, uh, of a personality, a Jewish personality, uh, They, 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 they wrote le juif, the Jew, you see, the, 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 the Jew and then the, uh, his name. That's exactly as could do the, 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 the Nazi. The, initially they were pro-German. Up to a moment when uh, uh, Hitler attacked Soviet Union. That was turning point, 1941. That's it. Then they immediately became anti-Nazi. Prior to that, they were pro-Nazis, pro-Soviets. The same in America was observed. Uh, it's qu quite funny because America is far removed. It's not in war yet. And yet, the 30s, in the 30s, particularly after 39, uh, all left-wing intellectuals were in favor of uh, alliance between Stalin and Hitler. They were pro-Nazi. Once they the, the Nazis attacked Soviet Union, they immediately changed. The problem with the West today is that uh, 
they don't care at all about what's happened with, in, in former communist countries. They believe the worst is over. They also very much depend on Russian oil and gas now as alternative source of, of energy uh, resources because Middle East is unstable. Traditional source of it. So other places also became unstable, like Venezuela. So Russia seemed to be, by comparison, uh, the much more stable source, alternative source of energy. Uh, which is stupid. I mean, they're playing a game like they played with Hitler and Stalin. The appeasement doesn't work with aggressors. The more they appease uh, uh, Putin, Putin's regime right now, the more aggressive it will become. I think the European Union is overwhelmed by the feeling that it is better to forget the past in order to avoid national tensions or national conflicts. And I strongly oppose this philosophy. Because if you, there, there is in fact no, uh, no reconciliation through forgetting. I don't believe in reconciliation through forgetting. Because uh, amnesia uh, is the worst way to go. We keep hearing about certain elements of our historical memory, but we cut, we castrate other parts of this memory. And I think that the general image that emerges from this operation is is very is a distorted vision of the of the European identity. We know that the Nazi crimes were bad. Now there are attempts to make them a little more relative, but communist crimes are totally ignored. Like I said, if 1994 in 1945 instead of finishing Nazism in Germany and putting them, the leading Nazis, on trial in Nuremberg, if instead of that the Allies would uh, accept some kind of perestroika in Nazi Germany, the Nazis would have been in power even today. Probably changed, somewhat milder form of Nazism, probably, probably without open ideology, uh, but they will be back in power in a few years. And look, I mean, what are you asking me about? The world, the world doesn't want to understand these things. I mean, can you imagine 1955, for example, if in Germany a former Gestapo officer was elected as a chancellor? Can you imagine what kind of hula-baloo it would have been in the world, right? But now we have a KGB colonel elected president of Russia, and no one says anything. As you observe today, they became very aggressive uh, uh, concerning all the neighboring countries, Georgia, uh, not to mention Chechnya, uh, uh, Moldova. Uh, it, it's growing aggression against what they call near abroad, uh, the former republics of the Soviet Union. I've just read yesterday that they prohibited sale of, of uh, uh, Latvian sprats in, in, in Russia, which, <laughs> which used to be quite common. That is also a political gesture. They also use oil and gas as as imperial weapon now, blackmailing all the countries which depend on it. So this is a direct result of the fact that we did not condemn the communist uh, uh, regime as a crime against humanity in the 90s, when, we, when it could be done. Uh, as a result, the communists rebounded uh, in a different shape. They don't call themselves communists anymore, but they're KGB officers. And the KGB, according to Lenin's definition, is the armed, uh, armed detachment of the Communist Party. So that's the same thing, only on a different name. And they're now controlling everything. They conduct genocidal war in the Caucasus. Uh, they, uh, they bully all the neighbors around. They introduced, once again, political repressions inside of Russia, closed down independent media, kill journalists. They do whatever they like. It is a restoration of the communist system, in a sense, without ideology. Uh, so this is a direct result of the fact that the regime was not condemned, the communist regime was not condemned, and its crimes were not condemned uh, at the beginning in the 90s. It is very dangerous because uh, uh, a country which uh, builds its future on uh, lies about the past is... Uh, is not well off, uh, and it's, it's dangerous for the for the neighbors because, uh, as we seen, uh, Russia has absolutely no no remorse about the past, uh, 
especially since Yeltsin, Yeltsin went away. Uh, so uh, Russian behavior becomes more and more aggressive because of this, I, I would say, because of this lie, underlying lie about the past. So why we are saying it's not only our moral duty to have the condemnation of communist crimes equated to those of Nazis. It's not only our moral duty, our political belief. It's also practicality. If we want the former communist countries to develop normal and working democracy and market economy, we have to start by condemnation of the crimes committed under communism. Without that, no nation can start rebuilding itself. Whoever committed a crime, especially crimes against humanity, crimes uh, without statute of limitation, these crimes cannot uh, remain unpunished. And whether the Nazi communists or whoever did it must be uh, brought to, to justice. Uh, one of them, the guy who was in charge of execution, uh, General Suprunyankov, was still alive in 1991. And we, I've written an article in the West saying, look, why don't you extradite him? 1991, 1992. Uh, communists are not in power in Russia anymore. You can demand an extradition, put him on trial. He was alive. Everyone in Moscow knew where he lives. People would show his window in Sadova Circle. That's it. That's his apartment. Like now, a few days ago, Italian court condemned some Nazi, because now we know, because we had, they have found some documents, and they know precisely who were in that commander, commander group of, uh, of um, Nazi regiment, who slaughtered in few Italian villages on the way, on the way back. They slaughtered something like, uh, you know, um, eight, nine hundred uh, persons per village. They did that in uh, two or three villages in the Second World War. And now, a few days ago, Maybe some of those perpetrators are still uh, still alive, but even that is not the point. It is the, because many women, many children were killed, I mean, just they were slaughtered. So their relatives, because I saw the interviews of the relatives, they had a big relief. It will not change anything, but once again, it gives to those people who have suffered this cruelty, it gives them feeling that, yes, there is the hand of the law is overriding after all, even if it comes 60 years later, and gives to those people, yes, I live in a real dignified human society, and those who perpetrated such a, you know, terrible acts, they are condemned. And why would communism escape this Universal rule. Well, I, I don't see any problem with that. I mean, if someone committed a crime against humanity, as we all know, it has no statute of lim limitation. So whether he is old or young, whether it was 20 years or 50 years ago, he should stand the trial. We do that to the former Nazis. Periodically, some of them are captured somewhere in the jungles of Latin America and brought to trial, despite the fact that it was all 50, 60 years ago. So why don't we do the same? I don't see any problem with that. If someone is a mass murderer, he must stand the trial.